The Night Beat starts right now. Bars, gyms, and car dealerships. The mayor is saying those are the three major areas hospital CEOs reported as seeing a rash of new COVID cases from patients. Metro Health is concerned we could be missing out on other valuable data. Contact tracers who try and find the source of infection are still faced with the problem of being shut out in their investigations. Assistant City Manager Dr. Colleen Bridger says people are not answering the phone or don't return their phone calls. We would know a lot more about this and how to respond appropriately to this spike if we had people answering the call and giving us that information. Let's take a look at the latest numbers tonight. The total number of COVID-19 cases in Bear County now stands at 5,962. That's another jump of about 400 cases since yesterday. The number of deaths also on the rise tonight with four more deaths now reported and that brings the total to 96. Well, more than 2,400 people have recovered. More than 3,300 people are now fighting the illness. When it comes to cases in the hospital, the number continues on its upward trend with 322 people now in the hospital. The night team's Tiffany Huertas reports while we are seeing more testing, an increase in the rate of positivity is also on the rise. What concerns me and I think what concerns a lot of folks the most is that this peak is accelerating so fast. The city reports there are more than 300 patients in the hospitals, 101 patients in intensive care and 50 patients on ventilators. We're seeing this curve rising exponentially and when we talk about flattening the curve, this is the curve that we're trying to flatten one of them. While 78% of ventilators are still available, there is concern those numbers can change quickly. We are monitoring it hospital system by hospital system um, and we know the availability of ventilators and right now there is not a shortage. We are just worried about if we continue to see this rapid of an increase over time that could become a problem. Dr. Georges Benjamin, executive director at the American Public Health Association, says there's also been new developments in treating a patient since the pandemic started. There's this fancy technique called proning which is uh, simply putting people um, either on their tummies or on their side. It turns out that with this particular disease, the way it attacks the lungs, um, if you take people and position them a certain way, um, their lungs work better, and you may not have to put them on a ventilator. Mayor Ron Nuremberg making it clear to not let your guard down. Back in May, about 4% of people tested came back positive for COVID-19. That's now changed. Over the last week, the positivity rate on these tests is now 19%. Those who are showing up for testing, 19% are actually positive with COVID-19. Masks and keeping six feet apart, the mayor says, is important to getting that number down. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Mask up. Again, physically separating yourself six feet from others and wearing a mask are two important tools the city continues to encourage. There have been some who have questioned if masks even work. Can they really protect you if the viruses are so small? It doesn't stop all of it, but it stops enough of it. The thing about viruses is you need a critical mass in order for that virus to be able to infect you. And so when you are able to reduce that viral load down below that critical mass, then the onesies and twosies that get through out into the, into the air, your body can fight that off. It's when it gets inundated with all that heavy load of virus. A reminder, the executive order requiring masks at businesses where the public cannot keep six feet apart will go into effect on Monday. Both employees and visitors will be required to follow the order in these situations. Businesses will also need to post their health and safety policies where they can be seen clearly. And more people are trying to get tested and Metro Health is making changes because of that. A new testing site will be open this weekend in East Bear County. The walk up testing will be conducted Saturday and Sunday at the Emergency Services District 12 station 136. It's located in the 11,000 block of Highway 87 East in Adkins. Testing will take place from 8 in the morning until 4 p.m. on both days. And don't forget, there are also two pop up walk up sites. Tomorrow will be the last day of testing at Burbank High School and Jordan Middle School. Those testing sites will be operating from 10 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon. Dr. Colleen Bridger says next week 
The pop-up testing sites will be open six days a week. As concerns rise, businesses are ramping up cleaning and disinfecting routines. One option that bars, restaurants, and banks are looking into is electrostatic disinfecting. The night team's Patty Santos tells us why it's important that you ask the right questions before you hire a company. We're just doing our best here to keep it clean. Gym owner Sean Phillips says the cost of cleaning has increased dramatically to stay open, but he says paying for a high level electrostatic disinfection is an investment to add to their cleaning routine. You want to take care of your people. If, if any time, it's no time like the present. Right now is the time to do it. Really invest in your, your, your employees, really invest in the people that come in and out of your stores. It's a combination of water and the chemical that evaporates uh, that actual uh, disinfectant into the Year. God Save the Clean LLC says calls for this type of disinfecting have more than doubled in recent months and even more in the last few weeks since the state reopened. Now you got to be careful because there are companies out there that will say we're going to guarantee you this for 60 days and it's going to they'll like triple the cost. There is no true guarantee for this. As soon as there's foot traffic back in that location, that is another possible uh, cause for infection rate again. Julio Munoz says many people are riding the coattails of the pandemic to make money and start cleaning companies. They want customers to do their homework into a company, ask if any chemicals could be corrosive to the surfaces you're trying to disinfect. A company that's registered with the state and is insured is a plus. We did it so we can make sure that our, cu our customers know that we are a company, uh, that we're not just here for, you know, for two months and then we're just going to be leaving. Patty Santos, Case Tech. 12 news. Bear County is scheduled to help businesses stay protected from COVID-19 by distributing 1 million masks next week. Small businesses who would like to register for masks fill out the form online. We have that link on ksat.com. Masks will be distributed to business owners who have a confirmation email. Those distributions are scheduled to happen on Wednesday and next Saturday. Well, KSAT has you covered as this coronavirus crisis continues. Our web team has a list of testing locations. And if you want to learn more about the executive order set to go into effect on Monday, we have an article about that as well. It's all online at KSAT.com. And new on the night beat, he admitted to giving a homeless man a feces sandwich. That officer with the San Antonio Police Department fought for his job. But tonight we have learned he will not return to the force. Matthew Luckhurst was terminated in 2016, was one of the people featured in our Defenders special Broken Blue. A third party arbitrator today refused to overturn Luckhurst's indefinite suspension, while Luckhurst won his appeal for the feces sandwich incident in March of 2019. That former officer was back in front of arbitrators after a second incident involving an investigation that found Luckhurst left feces and, a, and spread a brown substance on a toilet in a woman's restroom at Bike Patrol headquarters downtown. No charges expected for a man police say accidentally shot his wife as he was cleaning his gun on the city's west side. It happened in the 7800 block of Ruby Meadow around 9 a.m. Officers tell us the 51 year old woman was hit on her side near her armpit. She was taken to University Hospital. She was talking and alert, though. She's expected to recover. A walk of solidarity in Cibolo, the community coming together demanding change. Cibolo police provided security as the march stretched over a mile from the everyday Christian church to the city of Cibolo Municipal Building. The peaceful protest had about 100 people from a range of young and older participants. It's a movement that follows others that are pushing for an end to racism and for more police accountability. It's been described as a second Independence Day. Juneteenth marks the day news came down in Texas that slaves were officially free. That news came down about two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. B. Michelle says she helped organize this Juneteenth block party and got it all set up within two weeks on the east side. She says while the more people asked for tickets, she also had to keep the pandemic in mind. B. Michelle hopes a message will be taken from tonight's event. As people leave today, I want them to understand that they have power. And you are here to be of service. And you, there's plenty of things that you can do to be of service, to vote, to help your neighbor, to just show unity. I just want them to know that they just help their fellow person, no matter what race they are. And B. Michelle says she will leave it up to the people to decide if they want another Juneteenth event next year.
By the way, this afternoon I had a conversation about Juneteenth with African American Studies Professor Carrie Lattimore from Trinity University. And coming up in our KSAT Q&A, he joins us for a live discussion about Juneteenth, the timing of the celebration, and what it can tell us today. Still ahead on the night beat, a rallying cry for a missing soldier growing here in Texas. The Army now combating criticism in the case. And as crowds prepare to show up to a political event for President Donald Trump, an urgent warning now coming in. The latest on the pandemic coming up next. The rally to find a missing soldier growing even stronger tonight. Private First Class Vanessa Guillen disappeared at Fort Hood in Colleen, Texas back in April. The Army is battling criticism on social media with claims that they're not doing enough. Guillen's sister says the family continues pleading for any information. I can't sit there and cry all day and not do anything because, if, you know, they're already doing that. The Army released these photos saying they show soldiers searching Fort Hood for any sign of the missing 20 year old. Here's those pictures. The Texas Equus search is scheduled to be back in Colleen next week to help the military in its search. The Army says they're launching an investigation into allegations Guillen was sexually harassed on base prior to her disappearance. A grim reminder that the coronavirus is still very real here in the United States. The CDC is now predicting up to 145,000 total deaths from COVID-19 in the next three weeks. ABC's Zareen Shaw has a story. The World Health Organization out with an urgent warning. The pandemic is accelerating and the world is in a dangerous phase. The CDC predicting another 25,000 Americans could die by July 11th. Coronavirus related deaths are up in 13 states and Washington, D.C. Hospitalizations up in 17 states, including Texas, up 108% since Memorial Day. Doctors there warning it could get worse. People are walking around without face masks. They're getting close together. If we don't take precautions, we're going to see a spike. And we're seeing one right now. Masks now mandatory for businesses in Dallas and Harris County. The idea is to see this as a no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. Apple taking measures too, closing 11 stores in the Carolinas, Arizona, and Florida. And for the fifth time, Florida has smashed its daily record. Over 3,800 cases in the last day. 10% of people tested there are positive. I think that we've started to see, you know, some erosion in the social distancing from probably some of the younger population. But this week, all eyes on Oklahoma. The state hit a record number of cases yesterday. Large protests are expected Friday night ahead of President Trump's first big rally in months. Tens of thousands of rally goers expected Saturday. They're even signing a required waiver, agreeing they won't sue if they catch the virus. I personally am not going to wear a mask. It's our option. It's our choice to wear a mask. I do trust my immune system. Health experts warning risks are high. We have been spiking since last week. So, and I'm not talking like this, I'm talking like this. So it, it's going straight up and all this can do is take us this way or that way, you know, over the top. This volunteer seeing firsthand how fast the virus travels. Marcy Guest volunteered in a New Jersey hospital for two months. When she came home to Arizona, she saw her state with record hospitalizations. Hardly anybody had masks on. People were not socially distant. What will it take for people to realize that the virus is real? Now some places are cracking down on face masks. Phoenix City Council just passed an ordinance requiring everyone to wear them. Police there will be able to issue citations of up to $250 if people don't. Soreen Shaw, ABC News, Los Angeles. And here at home, HEB officials confirming more cases of COVID-19 among employees at 12 of their store locations. The grocery giant notified other employees who have been in contact with those who have tested positive, and each store has since been sanitized. We have a list of those locations online at ksat.com. Also, Walmart and Target say they are not going to release information relating to employees testing positive for COVID-19. Instead, the two companies told KSAT they are notifying all employees at specific locations when a positive case turns up. They will not, however, make the information public, unlike HEB, who has been keeping track of cases and providing periodic updates. You can find a list of those locations on KSAT.com. 
let's take a live look yes. outside with live cam. 81 degrees out there. Very hot and humid out there today. Adam. It is sticky. It is definitely yeah. sticky out there. And it's that time of year where it's going to stay sticky. We're going to have to get used to it all the way through the Father's Day weekend. And let's talk about our headlines here. Our last little shower of the evening. It's coming to an end out west right now. And so I think we'll be dry the rest of the night until sun up when we get a few sprinkles. But overall, not a rainy weekend. We will have some daily rain chances, but that's at those isolated pop up downpours. Brief too. African dust. It arrives early next week, so let's talk about all of this, starting with the radar, and we've had some areas of rain, especially out west, just clipped parts of western Valverde County. Thunderstorm complex from Big Bend region moved in. It's fallen apart, but gave parts of, of Highway 90 there, a little drink of water far west of Del Rio, and that's all coming to an end. Otherwise, what you see are some bats on that are taking flight from their respective caves and uh, hideouts, if you will, one way to put it. All right, take a look at the rainfall estimates today. Really, the sweet spot in the bullseye was DeWitt County, one to two inches just south and southwest of Quero. That was a nice spot. Even east of Quero, we had over an inch, and that stretched into parts of Lavaca County. And any, anywhere you see real color on the screen indicates where we got some rainfall and gives you the radar estimates. So clearly not a lot of coverage out there today, but it's better than nothing and we expect very similar in the days ahead. The severe weather threat, that was in North Texas and parts of West Texas earlier today. And there's a nice complex coming together here, Dallas to just north of San Angelo. If that really continues on its current path, we might, if we're lucky, we might get some leftover showers, especially in the hill country from this activity late tonight and early tomorrow morning. Just something to watch. Cross your fingers, okay? Cross your fingers. These are those situations where, because the upper level high is not directly overhead, the doors open for those types of disturbances to make it here, and sometimes we get those leftover showers. We've seen it before this season, and we will see it again. It's just the luck of the draw in this situation here. Odds don't favor it, I'll tell you that. Otherwise, upper level high over Mexico, western Mexico, and since it's not right over us, that helps us out a little bit, and we'll continue to see these pop-up downpours periodically, some of which can be very efficient rain producers. Saturday, Sunday, all the way through next week, 20 to 30%, so isolated in nature. All right, let's talk about the African dust here. And I'm gonna put this in motion. You see how that big concentration is right over the Atlantic. It's gonna continue to get pushed westward by the trade winds and by about Tuesday evening, we can expect some of that dust to be in our atmosphere. Not necessarily a real thick concentration of it, but as we go throughout the week, I do anticipate it to be in our sky. And of course that concentration is gonna vary throughout the week. So basically Tuesday, all the way through Friday is what we can see now is we'll have the dust coming and going out of our sky. If you're sensitive to it, you have a sensitive respiratory system, something to keep in mind. We see this every year. Okay, this is no different than any other year. We see it every summer, but this is just the first taste of it this summer. And if you don't even get you know, itchy eyes, watery eyes, runny nose, then you'll just notice some extra haze in the sky and it adds a little more color to our sunrises and sunsets. 81 right now feels like 85 with the humidity. 70s in the hill country, the rest of us mostly in the 80s. Del Rio, you're still at 92. And yes, of course, it's muggy out there. Dew points in the low 70s. All right, here's your Father's Day weekend forecast. Those isolated pop-up downpours Saturday and Sunday, just like the past few days, nothing's really changing here. Mid 90s for afternoon highs. And then we go into next week and temperatures really aren't gonna change a whole lot with the only big change being that dust in our sky, a little extra haze. And if you're sensitive to it, may get a runny nose, itchy eyes. Um, and that'll be late Tuesday through Friday of next week. Also, if we happen to produce a few downpours, they could be m the muddy rain type of downpours. You know, we get that sometimes. Hits your car, you can't miss it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of those. <laughs> oh, none of us are. No. Thank you, Adam. All right, when he was a spur, he was always seemed very honest and forthcoming yeah. about his opinions. Hasn't changed when he's become a Laker. No, and Danny Green talked with Karan Butler today on NBA Twitter, and Danny said he did not really know the meaning of Juneteenth until he moved down here to San Antonio and started working with the San Antonio Spurs. Well, Danny Green also opened up about his run-ins with racism, in particular an episode his brother had to deal with. Plus, a local boxer looking good. He remains undefeated. Coming up.
we're pushing to make this thing national and get everybody to let's stop and recognize what this day truly means. Cowboys Gerald McCoy using his platform to help spread the meaning and significance of Juneteenth in big board sports. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. On the heels of NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell announcing the league will observe Juneteenth as a permanent holiday. Multiple NFL teams announced June 19th as a permanent company holiday moving forward, including the Texans and the Cowboys. Two weeks ago, the Cowboys released a video featuring multiple players, including Dak Prescott, reflecting their stance on social injustice following the death of George Floyd. But Team owner Jerry Jones wasn't a part of that video. Many are wondering why one of the NFL's most powerful owners is staying quiet. Cowboys defensive tackle Jared McCoy wants Jones to speak out. When you have a franchise as recognizable as the Cowboys, people listen when they speak up. And the owner, Jerry Jones, who is one of the most recognizable figures in sports history, when he speaks, everybody listens. Well, I think at this point in time, I feel it would be great to hear him say something positive or say anything. You know, I, I, I love what he's been to the sport. He's been excellent to the sport of football. He's a Hall of Famer. But at this point, it's bigger than football. We need him to speak up about life. This is about human beings and equal rights. And that's not what's happening. And it would be great to hear him say something, Gerald, I anything. Appreciate McCoy walked two and a half miles today near his Oklahoma home to join from afar 93 year old Opal Lee, a retired school teacher who is walking from Fort Worth to DC in her attempt to get Juneteenth recognized. McCoy wants to become a national holiday. And the NBA has given employees paid time off for Juneteenth for the first time in league Thank history. You, the league hopes employees will further educate themselves on black history and reflect on the current state of race in the United States. Lakers shooting guard Danny Green was a part of a conversation on NBA Twitter with former NBA player Karan Butler to talk about racism from his perspective. And Danny shared this story about his brother. My brother who has been put on a hood before and been searched and checked. Um, he's basically just trying to ask them for help, trying to ask them. We were trying to get, you know, some air in our tire, or I think it was some gas. We were in high school, and he tried to, you know, wave them down. And then they pretty much, you know, pulled the guns on him, told him to get on the hood of the car, started searching them, like, yo, we're just looking for some air in the tire. Uh, but nothing directly from me. Danny also said he can't get the image of George Floyd's death out of his head. This week, the Judson Rockets returned to campus for voluntary strength and conditioning workouts. After nearly three months of working out at home, members of the football team were happy to get back on the football field to prep for the upcoming season. All-state linebacker Donnie Moody was there leading the charge. It's very meaningful. It's my last season here. You know, I want to go out with a bang and start strong and uh, hopefully win a state championship. It's surreal. You know, keep a smile on my face, keep me happy. This is this is my happy place right here, so it feels good to be back out here. It feels amazing to be back. It's like you missed it so much and now it's here, so it's a blessing. What do you think you miss most about not being able to practice? Uh, missing my team, really, because it's really a family bond. Once again, the Rockets are one of the top 6A teams in the area and state, and the addition of Jordan Battles makes them even better. Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver Cyril Grayson and former Green Bay Packers safety Mike Tyson have been in town for a three-day stint putting on a youth football clinic. San Antonio is the pilot city for the program fifth quarter. The camp includes mentorship and skills training, and a handful of Brandeis sophomores came out for the inaugural event. Now, they hope to expand the program throughout the country. Grayson talks about how the extra effort players put in now equals results and down the road and why the name fifth quarter fits the mission of the program. If you're a young guy like these guys behind us and you're trying to take somebody's spot um, that's a starter, if you will, they're freshmen going into their sophomore year, so they, they want to earn an extra spot, so they have to go a little bit harder, and so that's what it means. A fifth quarter. Coming up, the local boxer remains undefeated.
San Antonio Bantamweight Robert Biggie Rodriguez beat Adrian Sharkey Servine last night in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Hotel without fans. A win is a win, right? Round two, the scheduled six-round bout, and Biggie dropped Sharkey to one knee with a right hook to the chin, but Sharkey would get back up and keep fighting. Now, late in the round, Biggie starts connecting with shots to the head, so the ref stopped the fight. Two minutes and 48 seconds into round two. Robert Biggie Rodriguez improves to 8 0 one one with four KOs, and guys, he is just 20 years old. Wow. Some, some pretty uh, vicious shots he landed. Yeah, there. it seems like he's got a bright future. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Our KSAT Q&A talking about Juneteenth is up next. Our KSAT Q&A tonight is all about Juneteenth and what this holiday can teach us about where we are today. Dr. Kerry Lattimore is the Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at Trinity University. I appreciate your time all day today. I know you've been, you're, you're probably Juneteenth talked out by this point, but we're gonna ask you a few more questions. Obviously Juneteenth started years after, you know, it's commemorated by the landing and the declaration made in Galveston two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Did that Correct. make it a Texas? centric you know events. yes i mean in a sense it is a texas centric because that was the the order was for texas and so that's where the celebrations began but of course the celebrations will move to other places because african americans are moving um even though we've seen ways and we talked about it before how former masters and others were trying to keep african americans kind of in certain places african americans were expressing themselves and moving around as much as they could. And so as they moved, they took with them the Juneteenth celebrations. And so um, as the country, uh, as a um, Jim Crow period evolves, as we end up into the 20th century in the World War I era, and that brings the Great Migration, African Americans are moving to northern cities. They're moving west. They're moving lots of different places, seeking jobs, but they're also taking their history with them, which would also be Juneteenth celebrations. Speaking of those celebrations, Dr. Lattimore, you know, obviously it's been around for generations. How have celebrations changed this year specifically, not only in light of COVID, but also in light of a lot of the um, race and racial issues that we're seeing today? I think there's a greater attention on racial issues um, right now and for um, obvious reasons. And because of that, I think um, Americans want a greater understanding of um, that history with race. And I think the African American, the history of the African American experience is always one that's going to be a very complicated situation. How do you have slavery in a country that's supposedly free? How do you have um, Juneteenth when the Emancipation Proclamation was supposedly issued two years earlier? These are complex questions, but they're also questions that weren't really resolved then. Um, because full equality and liberty did not come after Juneteenth, I think it's raising the questions with us now. Um, and we're seeing some of those similarities of how we haven't fulfilled those dreams. When slaves came out and became free people, they had the hopes and dreams and the optimism of being part of the political system and to be full citizens. We saw how difficult that was and how in many ways they were not allowed to um, exercise those rights or how those rights were restricted, well, we still see certain rights or certain privileges restricted today. And I think because of that, we see the similarities in some ways of the experiences. That doesn't mean that things haven't changed. They certainly have. But I think what's happening today is raising the attention of what happened in the past. And we're trying to find out more about what happened in the past so that we understand what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I had an extensive conversation about 30 minutes or so this afternoon that you can see on KSAT.com and I believe the Trinity website. And so we're going to be able to cover all of that. So I urge people to watch that full interview. Uh, I am a history buff. I love history. I love reading. Those are the books that I read. That's kind of what, you know, I, I tend to watch the History Channel a lot. Why did it take... Why is it Juneteenth the celebration and not the emancip when the Emancipation Proclamation <clears throat> happened? Well, the Emancipation Proclamation is a political document, and it was issued by Abraham Lincoln. Um, it took effect January 1st, 1863, and it only affected the areas 
um, that were currently in rebellion against the United States. So that's the areas of the Confederacy. Um, obviously, because the Confederacy was in um, rebellion against the United States, they had seceded from the United States, they were not going to recognize the Emancipation Proclamation. And so unless the Union Army came in and took control of an area and then the Emancipation Proclamation came through, those slaves were not going to be freed because the Emancipation Proclamation was not going to be recognized. And so even though the war, for all intents and purposes, was basically over on April 9th, 1865, um, when Lee surrenders his forces um, at Appomattox, Richmond is going to fall, um, you still have the Army of the Trans-Mississippi, which is an area you know, that includes Texas, that still was fighting. You still have a couple of skirmishes, one skirmish in Texas that happens in late May. And so that had to be cleared up before Union soldiers could really fully come into Texas and then come into Galveston to kind of issue that order to have the Emancipation Proclamation fully recognized. And then even for some slaves, the Juneteenth wasn't it, they had to wait really for the 13th Amendment to kind of clarify their status. You know, Dr. Lattimore, there's been a, a push to make Juneteenth a federally recognized holiday. Do you think that will happen someday? I do. I, I think um, we are a very diverse nation. And the story of Juneteenth um, and the way that those, those free persons protected that story um, and, and the way it is an American holiday, because it shows us in our greatest complexities um, and yet the things that those former slaves held dear, the rights and privileges and, and wanting to exercise their citizenship and how they held the memory of the meaning of Juneteenth to their hearts, it says something and it's an American story. How they could join together the next year and celebrate it the next year and they tell those stories. Um, it says what's really great about our nation, that they took freedom so preciously that they were willing to sacrifice for it because they made sacrifices too um that they were willing to buy parks in some areas to celebrate emancipation for them and that even if their lives weren't perfect they still held together to celebrate but also to hope and they never wavered in their hope for a better day and i think i meant i think i ended this interview the same way that we did earlier but I, I, I don't think we can say it enough that Juneteenth is not just an African-American holiday. It's an American holiday. Absolutely. It's for everybody. Um, it's for everybody because we are all Americans. We are all one people. And our stories create the whole of the American experience. Without this experience, we don't really have the fullness of the American experience. And the American story is a story of presidents and vice presidents and Supreme Court justices, but it's the, also the story of servants and slaves and immigrants and others who've come to make our country what it is. So those full stories make us who we are, Americans. Dr. Carrie Lattimore, Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at Trinity University. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks for staying Thank up so late much. with us. Appreciate it. Have a good Thank weekend. You. you too. Thank you. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. A statue of Christopher Columbus in Houston has been taken down after being vandalized multiple times within this past week alone. Crews went out to Houston's Bell Park to take it down this morning. The statue was commissioned by the Italian American Organizations of Greater Houston and donated in 1992. But critics have said Columbus shouldn't be viewed as someone who discovered America, but as a foreign conqueror who enslaved natives. No word on if the statue's removal will be permanent. Here in San Antonio, District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino has pushed to get the Christopher Columbus statue removed as well. And we just talked about it. On this day 155 years ago, the last slaves in America learned they were free. This year, millions of Americans are commemorating the holiday known as Juneteenth by looking to the future while still remembering the past. The celebration of emancipation comes amid worldwide protests highlighting racial injustice. Daryl Forges reports. 
93-year-old Opal Lee has been fighting for years to make Juneteenth a national holiday. Juneteenth is trying to address the hopelessness. Across the country, America's original sin called out with marches, rallies, and cries for justice. This is the day that we try to right the horrific foundation. June 19th. 1865, 155 years ago, a celebration of emancipation when slaves in Galveston, Texas were finally told they were free. But more than a century later, no no the fight to end systemic racism and injustice continues. Who would have thought that in 2020, all these years later, that black Americans are being killed on a regular basis. This year, a new significance as the death of George Floyd sparked nationwide protests and calls to defund police. They want us to be investing in communities and neighborhoods that have been overlooked and, and under invested in for decades. In California, thousands rallied at the Port of Oakland. In the nation's capital, NBA and WNBA stars led a march calling for unity. And in Texas, a 93-year-old woman walked two and a half miles for her cause. I didn't get what I wanted, but I haven't given up. In Atlanta, I'm Daryl Forges. Take a live look outside with live cam. The weekend is upon us. What's it gonna look like, Adam? You know, it's gonna look like well, really, the past few days. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to look like the rest of the days we've same had this week. Same Let me I'll be honest with you here. Completely <laughs> transparent. It's not going to change all that much, but we will have that African dust coming into the picture as we get into next week. 95 was our high temperature today after a morning low of 77. Now you look at highs across South Texas, and we were all in the 90s, but no triple digits. Hey, we have that going for us, right? And still slight chances of rain pretty much every day. Look at this beautiful sunset. I don't know if you were outside right around sunset, but we had some pretty good color out there. And this came in from Bernie. Thanks for that shot. And I actually captured a time lapse. It's not the best angle, best view, but either way, you'll see a little bit of color here. Oh, there it is. Oh, yep, mm hmm Good color, right over downtown briefly this evening. All right, 103, that's the record for today. That was set back in 2011, so not all that long ago. The record low, 59, set back in 1912. Notice these cooler temperatures up in North Texas. That's where we have some thunderstorms. I talked about them earlier in the newscast. If they continue to organize and really drop southward, there's the off chance that we could get some leftover showers from those late tonight and early tomorrow morning. Keyword, off chance, just that slight chance it could happen. It's happened before, but it doesn't always happen in these situations and odds don't favor it. All right, temperatures right now, 76 in Kerrville, you're 79 in Rock Springs, still 92 in Del Rio and 81 here in San Antonio. So when we wake up tomorrow morning, you can anticipate temperatures in the 70s with that high humidity, very sticky out there. Low 70s in the hill country, Fredericksburg and Rock Springs about 71. Here in San Antonio, we're thinking about 76 and as warm as 78 in Laredo and Corpus Christi. Then by the afternoon, we surge back into the 90s, just like we've been doing. I think we'll be about 94, 95 here in San Antonio. If we're lucky, we could keep it in the upper 80s in the hill country. So Rock Springs, Kerrville, Fredericksburg. Wouldn't shock me if you didn't even hit the 90 degree mark tomorrow. For the weekend, mid 70s in the mornings, mid 90s in the afternoons, we still have those 20 to 30% chances of rain. So the isolated downpours that we've been seeing, well, some of us have been seen will continue to pop up here and there on the radar screen. It's not going to be all that widespread. Just those brief downpours that can be efficient rain producers at times. All right, as we look ahead, then we get into next week. More of the same, not changing much. Here's the big difference, though. We'll have that African dust. I talked about this earlier, likely settling in our sky by late Tuesday, lasting through next week. It's the same type of thing that we get Every year in the summer months, the Saharan dust comes from Africa, travels thousands of miles our way. And then if you're sensitive to it, you can be affected. A sensitive respiratory system or even sometimes just itchy, watery eyes and a runny nose. Either way, that could come into play by late Tuesday through the rest of next week. So something to keep in the back of your mind. Steve, Isis. All right. Thank you, Adam. 
as states reopen, freezes on rent and evictions are beginning to expire and people will be faced with repaying months of back rent. Up to 23 million Americans are at risk of eviction by the end of September. Experts say it's a housing crisis in the making. Renters in 42 states have been protected under eviction moratoriums, postponing rent payments as the economy stu stutters due to COVID-19. But 40 percent of those moratoriums have lifted and more than 45 million Americans are still without a job. The United States can expect an avalanche of evictions that will impact the entire community and have a cascade of additional losses, everything from financial well-being to health uh, to housing opportunities across the country. The HEROES Act passed by the House but stalled in the Senate would provide $100 billion in rental relief, including a national moratorium on evictions. As COVID-19 continues to affect more families and more people, it's time to figure out how you might handle laundry if someone in your home tested positive. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz has some simple but important steps to keep you healthy. If you're living with someone infected with COVID-19, something as routine as laundry deserves extra care. First, Consumer Report says keep any contaminated laundry in a separate bin. We don't know exactly how long this coronavirus survives on fabrics or clothes, but researchers think that it's possible the virus can remain infectious on clothes for hours or even days. So for any clothes that may have been exposed to the virus, consider those contaminated and keep those in a separate laundry bin. If you have disposable gloves, use them. If you don't have gloves, you can absolutely do the laundry with your bare hands. And just be sure to wash your hands thoroughly afterward, whether or not you have gloves. You can wash the laundry of a COVID-19 patient as you normally would. Experts say no special detergent or bleach is needed, but use the warmest appropriate water temperature and dry completely. Remember to disinfect surfaces that may have been contaminated like the doorknobs and pulls. And if you're using a shared laundry facility, disinfect surfaces before you touch them. And most important, your chances of getting the virus from someone else directly are much higher than getting the virus from a surface. So the most important thing is to stay at least six feet away from anyone else. And when you're done, wash your hands. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. As we've been saying all week, a rapid rise in COVID-19 in our community. Businesses now scrambling to respond. And the Supreme Court issuing two major rulings. There's also a push for change from a city councilman in this week's Nightbeat in Review. Bars were allowed to reopen. Some are making the decision to shut down again. The well on the north side. We thought that it was best to shut down to give our staff a chance to get tested, make sure they are all healthy. Brooks Pub on the southeast side. We started seeing things happening at other clubs and people were testing positive and it was moving so fast that you have to make a choice. Amid this current surge of COVID-19 cases, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf and San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg announcing the return of mask requirements for the county. Now, initially, Governor Greg Abbott chastised county judges asking him for the authority to mandate face coverings. Today, the governor clarified his previous position, saying his own order allowed this option all along, at least as far as businesses are concerned. Nothing in this executive order precludes requiring a customer to follow additional hygiene measures when obtaining services. What that means in English is that it does provide some level of either state or local control to make sure that businesses operate in ways that are safe and that reduce the spread of COVID-19. That was the governor at six o'clock. He went on to say during his interview with KSAT today that his order only opposes mandating face masks on members of the public when they're out and about. It was a ruling that barred workplace discrimination, reasons including race and gender. And today's Supreme Court ruling confirmed the same protection 
extends to others based on sexual orientation. The Supreme Court upheld the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, also known as DACA. It protects hundreds of thousands of immigrants brought to the U.S. as children from deportation. President Donald Trump has pushed to end the program, and the court did leave a loophole to continue that effort. They were charged in the deadly shooting of Rayshard Brooks, a man shot in the back in Atlanta. Both former officers accused in the case turned themselves over to authorities today. And just west of downtown, a statue of Christopher Columbus could be up for a vote on its removal. District 1 City Council member Roberto Trevino wants it on next week's agenda, saying it could be moved fairly soon if City Council approves it. We'll take a look at this. A gym owner in Southern California is using designated areas for members to work out in amid the pandemic. They are workout pods and they're made of pipes and shower curtains. Pete Sapson, who owns Inspire South Bay Fitness in Redondo Beach, says he and his wife came up with the dividers to offer users extra protection. His idea has gone viral, but Sapson says he hopes things can go back to normal someday. All right, right now on KSED.com, the call is out for junior meteorologists. If the kids are bored at home, we'd love to see a video of them giving the weather forecast. Parents, you can now upload your junior meteorologist videos through our website, KSED.com. We have an article on how to do that right now on our homepage and you might see your child on air on GMSA at 9. Very cool. Junior Caskies. I, I love those. They're, they're <laughs> great to watch. I love this one. The the girl at the end said, Liberty Biberty. You know, like oh, that commercial, and she just threw that it in there. Cute. It's like, oh, well done. All right, the aquifer, it's down almost half a foot today. We're 661.8. Obviously, we could add more rain to it. We'll get just those isolated downpours here and there briefly through the next seven days. Mold, pigweed, and grass all on the low end. As for the weekend, honestly, no big changes. It's more of the same, mid-90s and 20 to 30% chance of those downpours. For all the fathers and yes. father figures out there, have a great weekend and thank you for all you do. Happy Father's Day.